dear viewers the sale of immovable properties by nris and ocis is a major issue which is being discussed on this channel a lot of you have asked me in the comment section to produce videos uh, highlighting what needs to be done what needs to be considered how it has to be actually handled at the time of sale of these immovable properties today's video is an attempt to bring all the information you need to know or take into consideration while you sell your immovable properties in india this is nri money clinic for you and i am dr chandra khan but investment consultant and a financial planner nri money clinic no hype just the right advice dear viewers to talk about this complex subject of capital gains on the sale of immobile properties i have brought to the studios my eminent faculty chartered accountant sri ram rao as you all know mr sri ram rao is a practicing chartered accountant a partner at nitin j shetty and co he is a specialist on nri affairs he is a specialist on direct taxes mr sri ram rao services a huge clientele spread across globe he has to his credit solving the many of the tax queries of high net worth individuals across the globe welcome to the show uh, mr sri ram rao thank you yeah. mr sri ram rao i know it's a very vast subject it's a herculean efforts to uh, make this into a concise simple program nevertheless we will try our luck in making this as simple as possible dear viewers this capital gains uh, topic is pretty vast to make it simple to keep the length of the video very short we are attempting it in three parts part 1 part 2 and part 3 when we release these parts please make sure that you listen to all the three parts to get a holistic information about this particular topic mr shriram rao sale of immovable properties attract capital gains tax yeah can you tell what exactly is capital gains tax we talk about income tax we talk about capital gains tax can you divide these two what is capital gains tax capital, gain? capital gain see capital gain tax is nothing but you know it's a part of income tax capital gain per se if we have to explain that uh, it says any gain arising out of a transfer or sale of a capital asset okay now capital asset comprises of uh, many components many components uh, would include immovable properties say drawings paintings and shares and securities and mutual fund units and so on and so forth there is a big list of it so uh, if any person during a financial year has sold any immovable property or any capital asset for that matter the gain what he is earning out of it would be taxable as capital gains it's a part of income tax itself there is no separate law pertaining to capital gains okay well capital gains comes from sale of uh, movable and immovable uh, properties or assets Correct. today's video we will restrict this to only the immovable properties yes. okay now in case of immovable properties we get to hear this term called long term capital gains tax and the short term capital gains tax can you briefly tell me what is long term gains and what is the short term gains now if any capital asset or say immovable property hmm. for that matter since we are talking about immovable property alone if the immovable property being a land building or you know a land appurtenant to the building if it is held for a period of more than 24 months then it will be construed as a long term capital asset okay and any gain earning out of such asset which is held for more than 24 months it will be categorized as a long term capital gain okay or long term capital gain tax needs to be paid on sale of that particular asset if the asset is held for 24 months or lesser than that period then the gain arising out of that will be considered as a short term capital gain Hmm. and short term capital tax has to be paid on that short term capital gain what you so, earn from that so period. the holding period is 24 months if yes. it is less than that it is short term yes if it is more than that it is going to be the long term capital gain yeah tax. for immovable property per se yeah i have a doubt in my mind now correct. people receive uh, properties as gift correct in case of gift 
how do you categorize long term and short term gain or what should be the holding period uh, for a property which is acquired by way of gift now in case of a property which is acquired by by way of a gift or inheritance that also is part of that it is similar to that so if the property is acquired by way of gift or inheritance then the holding period has to be taken into consideration the holding period of that particular person who has inherited plus the holding period of the person uh, that is the immediate predecessor mm. so the holding uh, how many times how, how many months or years he has held that uh, asset in his hand in okay. his position that also needs to be added here okay which means to say if i receive some gift my holding period does not start from the day i received the gift no. rather it starts from the day the the person who gave me a gift yes. from the holding uh, period of that will also be added to this for computation of short term or capital gains yes or tax absolutely okay uh, one uh, question many people have asked to me is that now the sale of agricultural land correct is exempted from capital gains tax mm. is it true or is there any exceptions or is there any guiding principle uh, when it comes to question of capital gains on agricultural land okay now in a layman's language if i have to say then in case of a sale of agricultural land which is situated in a rural area uh huh that is exempted if the agricultural land is situated in a urban area it is a capital asset and uh, tax has to be paid whether it's a long term or short term it depends on the holding period okay so you mean to say if it is an agricultural land in the rural area it is exempted yes whereas it is in the urban areas it is taxable correct now my question is the complication is that how will you decide this what is the guidelines against this actually law doesn't say it's a rural area or agricultural area yeah. i mean uh, urban area what it says is if the land is situated in so and so circumstances in a so and so area hmm. it will be considered as uh, capital asset otherwise not hmm. for that one need to see where the land is situated which is the jurisdiction which is you know uh, under which that land is situated hmm. so if the land is situated within a municipal area municipal jurisdiction or say there will be municipality or there will be town panchayat or gram panchayat so if the land is situated within that jurisdiction then one need to see what is the population of that particular jurisdiction hmm. Hmm. so if the population is less than 10000 no issues Hmm. it will be considered as a rural area okay and uh, there will not be any capital gain if the population is more than 10000 but it is less than 1 lakh then if the land is situated within the jurisdiction hmm. plus if the land is situated within 2 kilometers from the radius of that particular municipality jurisdiction outside of that jurisdiction means there is a jurisdiction here and there is a 2 kilometer radius so if the land is situated within any of these areas then it will be considered as a capital asset okay otherwise if it is land with outside, of, it, that outside it, of that it will not be exempted yes it right. is exempted right. like that right but if if the population is more than 1 lakh but if it is less than 10 lakhs then this 2 km radius be, will become 6 km radius okay because it is a bigger town okay so the jurisdiction of that will be you know extended so if it is situated within 6 kilometers from that jurisdiction then also it will be considered as a urban uh, agricultural land it will be taxable yeah. if it is situated beyond that then it will not be taxable okay if the population is more than 10 lakhs then the uh, circumference will become 8 kilometers okay from so that jurisdiction right so if it is the maximum uh, distance from the urban area could be 8 kilometers 8 kilometers i can say for sure it can lead to a room for lot of interpretation yes. population statistics yes. measurement from which point to which point correct so it can give rise to interpretations yes so i will uh, leave that uh, topic here itself so i will yes. not get into further details all that we would like to remember here is yes agricultural land uh, is exempted from capital gains tax correct provided it is in the rural area correct and if comes under the urban areas the population guidelines and the uh, distance from the main uh, part of that uh, area has to be computed correct so you need to be guided by the local chartered accountants or the local authorities to decide whether it comes under the taxation or it's in the non taxation yes limit. exactly i will leave at that particular yes, stage sir. okay 
my next question to you is now we have these nris oci spread across the globe mm. many a times they are in a hurry to dispose of this land get rid of it repatriate the money and be done with it mm. can they sell this land mm. the immovable property irrespective of whatever the type of property to anyone or anyone can they do that or are there any restrictions that yes you can't sell it to them you can't sell only to these people are there any guidelines on that okay now income tax doesn't give any guidelines okay however one need to see foreign exchange management act fema mm. we normally call it as so under that there are certain restrictions if a person is selling an immovable property that immovable property is in the form of agricultural land whether it is urban rural whatever it may be agricultural land or a plantation property or a farm house mm. he can sell it only to a resident indian if it is agricultural land sell only to a resident indian yes no one outside no of one india no one outside of right. india okay? okay he cannot sell it to a non resident indian he cannot sell it to a oci he cannot sell it to a foreign national at all okay this is as simple as that that is one part of it second if it is any immovable property other than this hmm then the property can be sold to any nris oci is also along with the resident hmm provided these uh, non resident or ocis are not belonging to certain uh, you know uh, non friendly nations or you know border sharing nations with india i think this was a recent amendment which was done uh, after the chinese incursions or something like that right uh, not exactly because uh, india has been in dispute with uh, pakistan for a long period of time than okay that. so Uh, we have a lot of countries about 11 uh, countries which have notified in particular mm -hmm. say uh, pakistan afghanistan macau uh, china hong kong uh, bangladesh sri lanka bhutan mm -hmm. nepal uh, and even uh, the north korea so with those countries uh, if the person is a citizen of that country or is a nri coming from that country then actually you can't sell a property to that particular person so would it be suffice to say if an nri has to sell a immovable property hmm. first make sure if he is a resident or a nri if Correct. he is a nri find out whether he comes from a restricted territory hmm. which could be bordering uh, countries of india yeah. or there are some uh, restricted countries or if somebody is living in a particular country you are not allowed to sell, to sell that particular land Correct. nris have to be very careful when you are selling land to another nri find out whether he comes in a country which is not allowed to acquire land actually it's a obligation of the purchaser as well yeah. to truly and fully disclose uh, his uh, you know past and the background okay but on the part of the seller it also becomes his obligation to know and get to know who is the actual purchaser mm -hmm. so at least some kyc it is advisable to do i would say you do your due diligence to the yeah. best of your uh, abilities True. and know these points of law what you can do and what you cannot do and after you uh, sell this uh, property let it not uh, result in a, a litigation tomorrow or the authorities chasing you for sale of this Correct. Uh, land Correct. okay uh, one question that is there in my mind is now in india people sell immovable properties what should be the pricing for sale of these immovable properties is it a market price or is there something like a circle price or a fair market value dictated by the uh, the registration authority or notified by the government or it is just like any price between a buyer and seller what is it which one to be considered normally any price which is negotiated between the buyer and seller hmm. would be considered as a uh, you know full value of consideration for the purpose of any capital gain or anything however there is something called as a government rate or a guidance value hmm. or a circle rate hmm. it may be called uh, with the different names in you know hmm. a different part of our uh, country hmm. but there is something called as government rate or circle rate or guidance value what it defines is for that particular type of property which where it is uh, situated in a particular place hmm. the local uh, jurisdictional authority where you know that particular property has a jurisdiction with they have decided a particular price for that so that is a minimum price at which it has to be sold if i live in mangalore hmm. and it comes under the registration authority in mangalore correct you should be guided by the rates prescribed by 
that particular authority and it can't Correct. be lesser than that right yes it cannot be lesser than that okay. so of course there is small window which is given okay say uh, for example if the negotiation uh, comes up to a level that you know forceful selling and all those kind of things happen sometimes so at that time there is a hmm. leverage of 10% hmm. uh, below the price of that government value hmm. meaning that why if the sale consideration uh, say for example if i have to take if the negotiated sale consideration is 10 lakh hmm. and the guidance value is 11 lakhs hmm. so if i multiply 10 lakhs that is a sale consideration by 110% it will come up to 11 lakhs hmm. no issues hmm. if the guidance value is 11 lakh 1 rupee hmm. where my uh, you know multiplication with the my sale consideration of 10 lakhs will come up to 11 lakhs only hmm. where the guidance value is 11 lakh 1 rupee so at that time since the uh, guidance value is more than 10 percent of the sale consideration hmm. you need to take the guidance value as the full value of sale consideration okay so you have a window of 10 percent to be lesser but it should be very precise but yes. if you are trying to sell a uh, immobile property for a valuation which is less than 10 percent of the guidance value given by the local authority yes uh, then for capital gains the guidance value given by the local authority will be taken into account. Yes, local authority where that property is situated. Okay, yes. right. Now, one another problem of uh, selling the property and getting the consideration is people talk about I will pay so much money into the bank, you give me so much uh, money by way of cash. When somebody sells this uh, property, can the consideration be paid in cash? What does the law say about it? No. Income tax act is very much clear actually none of the consideration can be received in cash okay however again they have given a small window hmm. that say sometimes you know token advance or something like that immediately given hmm. so in that circumstance up to a rupees of 20,000 in that particular transaction of sale hmm. can be received in cash not more than 20,000 rupees 20,000 is cash consideration max Maximum. permitted by the law any yes. additional consideration has to be uh, paid into the banking channels yes documented uh, yes. transactions have to take place yes if it is more than 20,000 in cash there is a provision under income tax act to levy 100 percent penalty of the amount transacted in cash Okay, so <laughs> somebody has done a cash transaction and if it gets detected or uh, you report it uh, as a cash transaction, mm. it will attract 100% penalty. Yes. Nobody would like to do that. Yes, of right. course. Okay. One another issue uh, or one other question uh, or one other demand of NRA community is, yeah, we want to sell the immovable property. Let the buyer pay me into my NRA account or repatriate this money outside of India into a foreign bank is it possible or not now in the case of non residents mm. uh, fema regulates these transactions also apart mm. from taxation rules so fema clearly says that the consideration should come to non resident ordinary account nro account NRO. of the non residents or oci okay whoever is selling that property it cannot be directly be uh, credited to nre or you know foreign bank account mm. Uh, so it is a must that the fund should come to the non-resident ordinary Indian resident account even though you know sometimes what might happen is there are two you know I mean buyers and sellers both are NRIs so they live outside of India they have both have NRE accounts one NR from one NRE he will be transferring the consideration to another NRE hmm. he might mention that in the you know sale agreement legitimately hmm. that hmm. I have paid so much so much amount hmm. however and the seller has paid the taxes also there is no dispute hmm. so income tax would not be bothered about this hmm. since the tax is already collected hmm. but fema would say the fund actually should have come to nro account hmm. of the seller hmm. it has not come to that account hmm. so there is a violation of fema hmm. so it is obligated from the point of view of seller also to get that money only to his nro account so there are two angles of law here one is income tax which determine how much tax you have to pay correct the second is a fema law which says whether you have done this transaction in accordance with the provisions of the fema law hmm. which dictates money has to be paid into the nro account of the seller if correct. there are two nri 
uh, who are involved because right. you just have got uh, two of you have got NRE account. The considerations cannot be moved from one NRE account to the another NRE account, which is a clear violation of PEMA law and it can result in a big problem for you. Yes. So make sure if you are dealing with another NRI for sale of uh, property, the sale consideration has to be paid into the NRO account and not to NRE account and needless to say, it cannot be transferred to any foreign bank account. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Now let us uh, move one step further on. Now somebody sold the property and there is a capital gains and the capital gains taxes have to be paid on that. Correct. Uh, are there any exemptions which are available or is there any expenses? See, uh, when you are selling the land, there could be a broker in between, there could be uh, costs that get involved uh, uh, while selling this particular property, maybe an advertisement cost, maybe a mediation expense, whatever it could be. I sell it for a consideration. The net realized sale value, can I say this is my expense, I will pay taxes on the remaining amount only. Of course, yes. Because, uh, see, the sale consideration what is involved is a particular transaction amount. Okay. That is only a sale consideration. That is not your gain as such. Okay. You are liable to pay tax only on the gain. Mm. So, while determining the gain, mm. if it is a short term capital gain, what you are going to earn, because if the property is held for less than 24 months, then all the purchase expenses, all the se selling expenses, all the cost of acquisition of the property mm. or if there is any cost of improvement done in the property mm. can be claimed as a deduction. Okay, that is with respect to short term capital gain. Short term capital gain. If it is a long term capital gain, then the cost of acquisition and the cost of improvement will again get indexed to the year in which they sell. Okay. So, there is an additional benefit what they are going to get. Okay, so this indexation benefit is available only for long term capital yes, gains. Yes. In which, uh, apart from the purchase value, huh. whatever the improvement that you have done, hmm. subsequently you would have fenced the property or you Correct. have done some improvement, that can be taken as a cost and indexed as per when yes. you have done it. Yes. Proper calculations have to be made yes. into it. Yes. So, you are liable to pay taxes on the indexed cost, yes. not on the nominal uh, value that you get uh, at the time of selling. Uh, let us say your capital gains is 50 lakhs hmm. and the indexed value that hmm. is after adjusting to the hmm. inflation uh, between those two uh, points of tax, yes. if it comes to 30 lakhs, yes. so you are liable to pay taxes on the 30 lakhs which is called the indexed cost of acquisition. No, actually uh, the indexed cost can be claimed as a deduction from the sale consideration. Okay. I mean say for example, you purchase a property for 20 lakhs and you have incurred some improvement expenditure say about 5 lakhs mm. and that property you, ha you have incurred a cost up to 25 lakhs. Okay. And now you are selling it to say 50 lakhs. Mm. So now you have held that property for say about 5 years. Okay. Now from the year of purchase, the cost of purchase that 20 lakhs, that has to be indexed again to the year of sale. So about 5 uh, years, some indexation you will get, I am not sure. Uh, how the calculation will go here because uh, uh, the indexation will be different for different years. I can't okay, say. as I understand, huh. you have acquired the property for a particular value. Correct. Time has passed. Yes. And because of the time, inflation has come in. Correct. And there is an indexation table which is available. Available. Let's say if you have sold it, if you have purchased the property for twenty lakhs, hmm. and the index cost of that hmm. pro property today hmm. is twenty-five lakhs, hmm. and you sold it for fifty lakhs, hmm. you are liable to pay tax on sale consideration minus the index cost of the acquisition and that is on which you have to pay the capital yes, gain. Yes, that, that will be called as a capital gain. That is on called that uh, tax has to be paid. Okay, fine. And uh, at this juncture, I would also like to say certain things like say at the time of purchase of immovable property, stamp duty would be paid, registration uh, charges would be paid in addition to the consideration mm -hmm. no, at the time of purchase uh, by you. Okay. So, that cost also is eligible for claiming as a deduction as a deduction and uh, that can also be indexed okay there is no problem with that okay you mean to say at the time of purchase you have incurred certain expenses yes. that can also be indexed yes yes so that will be added to the purchase cost of the property correct that right. will be added to the purchase cost of and you will arrive at the indexed uh, value cost? of the property yes then you have a sale consideration hmm. your expenses of sale can be deducted yes the difference between this is the actual capital gains that will be computed yes on which you are liable to pay taxes yes correct 
and uh, one more pointer here is all the invoices pertaining to any expense that you claim mm. or say any other documentation to prove that this much expenditure has been incurred that should be with you documentary evidence documentary is evidence very important yes plus uh, the payment also should be channelized through the banking uh, modes mm. so any payments to these expenditures should mm. have been paid out of your bank accounts only mm. so both the documentary evidences one is bank statement as well as this would you know should match at that time you will be able to substantially uh, make a claim for that okay and uh, on demand that needs to be provided right so just don't make a claim that this is my cost yeah. and keep all documents in support of whatever deductions you have made or whatever the cost that you have added Correct. that's the way to go about and if it is questioned by the uh, tax authorities you should be in a position to prove that look i have got the documentary yes. evidence for that yes absolutely now you told about the index cost uh, to arrive at the capital gains yeah i have one doubt in my mind now hmm. how the indexation is calculated i'll tell you where the doubt is coming in my mind okay there are people who are sitting on a property for ages together multi generations correct these are very old properties hmm. these have been transfer uh, transferred to them by way of inheritance hmm. it is not 5 years 10 years it is not that they have purchased hmm. how will the indexation work if somebody has purchased let's say in 1947 hmm. how will you calculate from 1947 till now the indexation are there tables available or what's the methodology which gets involved in this now presently the law gives table for indexation from the year uh, 2012 that is uh, if the property is purchased on or after 1st of april 2001 aha uh-huh. then there is a proper indexation table available for that year okay. on year what is the index to be uh, taken into consideration okay if the property is purchased prior to 1st of april 2001 hmm then either the cost of purchase hmm or the government value uh, as on 1st of april 2001 hmm needs to be obtained from hmm. the sub registrar's office or any uh, registration authority where the property is situated hmm and that needs to be indexed to now okay so whichever is beneficial to you that you can take into consideration and index it to the present value okay i will uh, summarize my understanding yes, here sir. somebody purchased a property let's say 1995 hmm uh, it's not possible to index it from 1995 no. so no. what is considered is 1st of april 2001 correct right yes so you can see what is the government guidance value on that particular date correct and you can also check what was your acquisition cost in mm. 1995 correct and you should have a documentary evidence to correct. that now you can take whichever is the higher value yes for arriving at the indexation yes. for all properties which are before 1st april 2001 uh, your cost of acquisition or the the government value as on that day 1st of april 2001 will be considered for indexation purpose and indexation will be available from 2001 to onwards okay. even if the property is purchased prior to that understood that yeah. understood that see one of the question that uh, is there in my mind or a logical question is there are many people who buy this property by taking the loans correct you said that the expenses pertaining to purchase of property can be reduced from uh, the capital gains tax mm. Now if I have purchased this property with the help of a loan and over 5 10 15 20 years I have cleared the loan and the loan that I have serviced is more than the cost of the property correct so can I say I have paid so much of an interest I'll not pay the capital gains tax is it permitted or not no the see there is a small finer point one need to understand that is tax now on the sale of an immovable property is a capital gain tax which is a capital receipt mm okay now if a loan is taken that is only a source of fund for you to make purchase that mm. so when the loan is repaid that is the principal amount i am talking about that is already is uh, part of the cost of the uh, property so you cannot claim the repayment of loan as expenditure against the sale of a property because cost is already taken so it will be a double claim mm. when it comes to an interest portion this is paid year on year this is a revenue expenditure for you it's not a capital expenditure as such because it is not paid at one time so since it is paid year on year such interest cost whatever you have incurred can be claimed in the year of payment itself mm. against any income which is getting generated out of that particular property 
Okay. So you are saying don't charge it against the capital gains. No. Rather, on every year, if you have an income from that particular property, that is your income. Yes. And this is the expenditure. Yes. And subjected to whatever the restrictions that have been put in the capital gains, uh, the income tax act. Correct. You can set it off for that. Yes. But it can't be set it off against capital gains. 100% it cannot be set it off against capital gains. It has to be, say for example, if it is the immobile property, there will be a rental. Okay. So, rental income is a year on year receipt. Probably we have to do one more video on that topic itself and I have lots of doubts in my mind and uh, the video becomes very uh, lengthier. Yeah. I will definitely request you to come again to my studios and uh, give uh, more uh, information on how the interest can be charged against the income. Yes, okay? definitely. Right. Uh, one another question that is there in my mind is, there are instances or cases where properties are held jointly or severally. Correct. Okay. Now, how will the capital gains tax be computed by two of them jointly or can they divide? How will it work out? Uh, normally, if a property is held jointly, each person's share, what is the proportion in which he has held the title of that property would be mentioned. Okay. If it is not mentioned, generally it will be equally divided. So, this is how the general rule is. So, that one need to understand. Then, at the time of sale also, in the same proportion, the consideration will also come to that each particular individual. Hmm. So, when this property is sold, which is held jointly, the capital gain has to be calculated individually as per the consideration what they received and the cost what they had involved uh, included at the earlier period of time. So, and it is uh, suffice to say that it yes. will be calculated proportionally yes. at an individual level yes. to the extent of shares that they own in that particular asset. Yes, yes. So, it is not a jointly applying for a capital no, gains tax. No, so, it should no. be treated as an individual capital gains tax. Correct. Find out how much is your share and you are liable to pay taxes according to that as well as you can get the exemptions as per the uh, details what we have given in this particular video. Sometimes what it might also happen is say husband and wife might have jointly purchased. Yeah. So, wife might not have, you know, contributed for purchase, but she is there as a holder of the title for the convenience sake. Mm. So, at this time what happens is, uh, when the property is sold, even though she is, uh, you know, not contributed on the cost, the cost has to be bifurcated into two. Mm. It is advisable to bifurcate into two. Capital gain, uh, it is advisable to calculate the capital gain by bifurcation into 50-50 percent. Okay. So, even in that case, mm. so I j because this query is, has come up to me mm. in uh, earlier cases of mine. So, okay. I just thought to uh, share my information. Dear viewers, we here at NRI Money Clinic are trying to solve many of the problems faced by the NRI community. We are in a position to solve the problems faced by this community here in India. But our NRI community has lots of questions, lots of problems in the countries where they are living. If you are a professional who is working in US, Canada, UK, Ireland, Eurozone, Singapore, Australia, Japan, Hong Kong, China or any other countries where you have an NRI community, you have a chance to appear on our channel. If you are one of the professionals, chartered public accountant, a tax specialist, financial planner or advisors in any other financial field, then probably we have an interest in you and you get a chance to appear on our channel. If you are interested to appear on our channel to discuss the problems faced by the NRA community in your respective countries, please send us a WhatsApp message on the number shown here on the screen. We will get in touch with you and we explore the possibilities of associating with you. So, dear viewers, here we conclude part 1 on the capital gains tax that has to be paid on sale of immovable properties by whether it is a resident Indian or by non-resident Indians. In part 2, we will discuss other aspects of this capital gains tax. Uh, thank you Mr. Sridham for coming to our studios and bringing all this information for the benefit of our viewers. I look forward to having uh, part 2. Uh, of this episode uh, to highlight rest of the things our audience need to be knowing on this. Thank you very much for your uh, courtesy of coming all over here. You are welcome.
dear viewers hope the episode that we have done today gave you some insights into how you should compute your capital gains tax and what are the points that you have to keep in mind while you sell your immovable properties if it helped you to understand this mind field of taxation please give me a thumbs up if you are a person who is watching this channel for the first time or if you are yet to subscribe for this channel please hit the subscribe button and press the bell icon don't forget to share this video with your near and dear ones thank you very much for watching this episode on nri money clinic i shall be back with you with part 2 of the series very very soon press the bell icon for more details and subscribe our channel